the use and capacity of the broadcast spectrum for wireless and other services. The meeting of the Commerce Subcommittee on Technology and the Internet is 2 hours 15 minutes. Subcommittee will come to order. This morning, the subcommittee convenes a legislative hearing on two measures related to the availability of the wireless spectrum, which is essential to meeting our future needs for mobile communication services. The movement of personal communications to mobile services is both dramatic and accelerating. Earlier this year, it was announced that for the first time, the number of homes having only a cell phone and no landline service now exceeds the number of homes having only a landline and no cellular service. At the end of 2008, there were approximately 270 million wireless subscribers in the nation, including an estimated 40 million active users of mobile internet services. Daily, new attractive and useful applications are added to wireless services, and data rates continue to increase as consumers require faster access to mobile communications. As more and more Americans use data-intensive smartphones and as services like mobile video emerge, the demand for spectrum to support these applications and devices will continue to grow dramatically. Today, the subcommittee continues its examination of possible ways in which federal telecommunications policy can be altered in order to meet these challenges, with the goal of enhancing the consumer experience and facilitating the future growth of mobile services. In July, I was pleased to join with Chairman Waxman, full committee ranking member Barton, and subcommittee ranking member Stearns in introducing H.R. 3125, the Radio Spectrum Inventory Act. That measure, now before the subcommittee, would direct the NTIA and the FCC to undertake a comprehensive survey of the nation's spectrum and develop an inventory of each spectrum band in the U.S. table of frequency allocations between 225 megahertz and 10 gigahertz. The inventory would include the identity of both federal and non-federal users of spectrum and the types of services they offer in each spectrum band, as well as the amount of use in each band on a geographic basis. When the inventory is completed, the NTIA and the FCC would create a website in order to make the information gleaned from the inventory available to the public they would report the results of the inventory to the Congress. And that report would include a description of information that could not be made publicly available for national security reasons. It would also include a recommendation of which, if any, of the least utilized blocks of spectrum should be reallocated for commercial uses. The creation of the inventory is an essential step in making available more spectrum for commercial and wireless services and meeting the extraordinary spectrum demands that our nation will soon face. I've also joined our colleagues Jay Inslee and Fred Upton in introducing the Spectrum Relocation Improvement Act. This measure would address an urgent need which was brought to light after the FCC auctioned the advanced wireless spectrum, the AWS spectrum, in 2006. While that spectrum was auctioned more than three years ago, the winners of the commercial licenses still do not have full access to the spectrum because it's not been fully cleared by the government users. The bill that we have jointly introduced would hasten the process of clearing federal users from spectrum that the government has reallocated for commercial purposes. It would require the NTIA to publish the transition plan of each federal entity to be relocated after a spectrum auction, and it would clarify the steps that federal spectrum users must take 
in order to receive payment for their relocation costs from the Spectrum Relocation Fund, including a requirement that the Spectrum fully be reallocated and vacated by the federal users within one year. My goal is to have both the inventory legislation and the bill speeding the reallocation of previously auctioned government spectrum through the committee and through the House at the earliest possible time. I want to thank our witnesses for joining us this morning. We look forward to your testimony and your views on the future demand for wireless spectrum and the ways in which we can take constructive steps in order to meet those challenges. That concludes my opening statement. I'm pleased now to recognize the ranking Republican member of our subcommittee, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you've mentioned both of these bills, and you've talked about what they do. Uh, so we're very uh, pleased to have this hearing. Um, I'm a co-sponsor of both of these bills, original co-sponsor. It is very clear that the United States will need additional spectrum to meet the growing demand for wireless broadband. In fact, we may be victims of our own success here. The United States currently leads the world in wireless. Wireless providers have used Spectrum to provide U.S. consumers with innovative voice and data services. The number of mobile voice customers in the United States has surpassed the number of wireline customers. And the number of mobile broadband customers has increased exponentially over the past several years. As customers increase the amount of time they spend on their mobile devices talking, emailing, and surfing the Internet, cell sites become constrained for capacity, for capacity. As a result, providers need more spectrum, especially in order to increase the speed of mobile broadband services. We are facing, in the words of the FCC chairman, a looming spectrum crisis. For example, a voice call requires approximately 10,000 bits per second while uploading and downloading video downloading. Video requires millions of bits per second. Countries will need a 1.3 or 1,300,000 megahertz of spectrum dedicated for commercial use by the year 2015, according to the International Telecommunications Union. Yet the United States currently has only 500 megahertz allocated and only 50 megahertz in the auction pipeline. So in order to increase the amount of spectrum available for commercial mobile services, the administration and the FCC need to inventory the current uses of spectrum bands, especially those below 3 gigahertz that are ideal for mobile services. The bottom line is that we need to know who uses which spectrum bands and the purposes for which they use such bands. Once we have the answers to these questions, the government needs to decide whether to reallocate spectrum for commercial mobile users. If the government is requiring existing spectrum users to vacate reallocated bands, the government also needs to establish a meaningful process for reallocating incumbent users. The process needs to begin sooner rather than later. Inventory, reallocation, and reallocation all take time and commercial mobile demand for spectrum is increasing, as I mentioned, exponentially. Furthermore, furthermore, one way to make more spectrum available for commercial purposes is to use government spectrum more efficiently and simply reallocate the spectrum saved. That was the idea behind the Commercial Spectrum Enhancement Act, which was enacted in 2004. The law is designed to provide funding to upgrade the wireless resources of government agencies while clearing additional spectrum for commercial use. While the CSCA, government frequencies identified for reallocation are auctioned to commercial licenses and the pr proceeds are used to improve the re ro relocating agencies of wireless facilities. Now, pursuant to the CSEA and the FCC held the Advanced Wireless Service 1 auction in 2006. Of the $13.7 billion raised by the AWS auction, Approximately $1 billion has been spent to reallocate the wireless operations of 12 federal agencies. The reallocation procedures outlined in the CSEA worked well in most cases, but some problems have cropped up. For example, T-Mobile paid $4.2 billion to build a 3G network. The Department of Defense and the Drug Enforcement Agencies are behind scheduling and clearing some of the spectrum. 
However, because of unforeseen costs and complexities in their moves, which have been compounded by the confidential nature of some of the agency's activities, problems like these have prevented the bidders from fully realizing the benefits of their investment in the time frames originally promised and may discourage participation in future reallocation auctions. H.R. 3019 will make the process more efficient. The goal is to better coordinate reallocation so that prospective commercial bidders have increased confidence to bid on the cleared spectrum. This not only helps the commercial bidders, but also the reallocating agencies, since they will have increased revenue from the auction and a better <laughs> planned transition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses. Thank you very much, Mr. Stearns. The Chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, thank you for holding this important legislative hearing on two bills that, if adopted, will create incentives for efficient spectrum utilization and enhance our ability to develop forward-looking spectrum policies. Ongoing developments in wireless broadband technology, along with increased consumer demand, have raised questions about the sufficiency of current spectrum allocations for wireless communication services. Some experts estimate that the wireless industry in the U.S needs an additional 150 megahertz of spectrum to simply keep up with the explosion in wireless data usage and to remain competitive with other nations. Before we can start identifying bands of spectrum that might be made, made available for these new services, however, we need to understand how existing spectrum is allocated and utilized. In simple terms, we need better information about spectrum usage by federal and non-federal entities. Accordingly, in July of this year, a bipartisan group of 18 Energy and Commerce Committee members introduced H.R. 3125, the Radio Spectrum Inventory Act. This legislation represents a critical first step in developing a forward-looking spectrum policy. H.R. 3125 is simply about making spectrum use and allocation transparent. It would direct the National Telecommunications Information Administration and the Federal Communications Commission to develop a publicly available inventory of users and usage in the most valuable spectrum bands. The bill also directs the agencies to examine whether there is underutilized spectrum that might be reallocated for more efficient uses. Of course, any comprehensive look at spectrum must be sensitive to military uses and the need to protect information about such uses. The bill therefore establishes a procedure by which information pertaining to national security will continue to be safeguarded. The committee will continue to work with the Department of Defense to make sure that we are sensitive to any concerns regarding our national defense. I would also like to express my general support for H.R. 3019 the Spectrum Relocation Improvement Act of 2009. I commend Representatives Inslee and Upton for introducing this thoughtful legislation to improve the current spectrum relocation process by increasing the flow of information and resources as well and as enhancing transparency. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. I look forward to working with you as we move these important bills forward. Thank you very much, Chairman Waxman. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the hearing. I would say that we need to be working on D-block, D-block, D-block. If we can't get the D-block right, how in the heck are we going to do other allocations of other spectrums? And, and my focus on the D-block is, as everyone knows, being involved with the E91 caucus is emergency services and communication. And uh, hopefully my colleague Anna will show, and, and even Jane Harmon, and we'll say, shame on us if we have a next disaster and we're not ready to communicate effectively. Shame on us if we have another 9-11. Shame on us if we have another Katrina. And we have sheriff departments not talking to firefighters. We have firefighters not talking to the National Guard. So I appreciate this focus, and, and we all understand the importance of having an inventory.
But if we can't get the D block right in a timely manner, who are we kidding ourselves? So I would hope, Mr. Chairman and, and, and uh, the full committee chairman, that we would really work on the parameters to push for an appropriate and proper auction in which we get all the benefits. We bring in the additional revenue, but we also develop the revenue streams which will allow us to provide grants and, and money to our first line responders to get this one important aspect of our homeland security issues and debates in line. And I yield back my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Shimkus. The uh, Chairman Emeritus of the Full Energy and Commerce Committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingell, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for convening today's hearing on H.R. 3125, the Radio Spectrum Inventory Act, and, and H.R. 3019, the Spectrum Relocation Improvement Act of 2009. These two bills, of which I am an original co-sponsor, will aid the federal administration in allocation of spectrum, a commodity of increasing importance, especially given recent advances in mobile broadband services. Like all the rest of us, I am concerned about the allocation, about the future, and also about what we have done so far and whether it has contributed to the proper use of the spectrum for the future and for all of our people. These two pieces of legislation are complementary to the Federal Communications uh, Commission duty to, represent, to present to the Congress a national broadband plan as mandated under the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act to be certain the success of the development of such a plan and the implementation of its recommendations will be facilitated in no mean degree by a clearer and better understanding of the spectrum available for use and a better and a more efficient process by which to allocate it for commercial use. This, I believe, will be accomplished in large part by enactment of the bills pending the committee's consideration today. With this in mind, I welcome our witnesses and look forward to hearing their views on the legislation before us. In particular, I hope they will engage uh, in a frank discussion about the relationship between H.R. 3125, H.R. 3019, and proposals currently circulating the FCC to reallocate spectrum o from over-the-air television broadcasters to mobile communication providers as a part of the National Broadband Plan. Thank you for your courtesy, Mr. Chairman, and I commend you again for this hearing and the foresight that you're showing with it. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Chairman Dingell. The gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, thank you for holding a legislative hearing on uh, these two bills. I think that's really important, an improvement of our process to uh, have this oversight uh, before we mark up. I want to welcome uh, my Senator, Gordon Smith, who has taken over the reins at the uh, National Association of Broadcasters. Uh, I'm still his congressman, even if he's not now my senator. Um, but uh, we've been friends and colleagues in the legislative arena in Oregon and here for many years, and we welcome you at the NAB. And now that I've sold our broadcast stations and you've gone to the broadcasters, I'm going to go into pee packing. Um, I, uh, I want to uh, point out a couple of things. First of all, I concur with my colleague from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, on the D-block issue. We need to resolve that. But I also want to point out uh, another issue that's come up related to uh, public safety, and I'm not sure it's going to get spoken to today. Um, and that is uh, use of the band by amateur radio operators as well. As we evaluate the value of spectrum, understand that when 9-11 happened, when Katrina happened, when other communication system failed, uh, and even any day when there's a hurricane or a disaster anywhere in the world, it is frequently the amateur radio operators who step to the fore with their own equipment and provide the emergency communication when everything else fails. It's hard to put a value on that unless you can put a value on saving lives. And, uh, and helping uh, our law enforcement community and our, our rescue community get through a really difficult time. So they're there when needed all the time, and so that needs to be a, a part of what we consider. Uh, regarding the FCC's notice, I'm very concerned about what I'm reading, uh, and uh, uh, regarding Professor Benjamin's comments, uh, and his paper, he is now a, a, a very top advisor to uh, the chairman at the FCC, and I hope this committee will look at some of the things he's had to say, including uh, how every dollar of additional cost for broadcasters, one less dollar for profit, and thus reduces the attractiveness of the over-the-air broadcasting as a business model. 
For regulation would tend to entrench broadcasting place on the spectrum, then the regulation will not help free up spectrum and should be avoided. In other words, he's calling for the, the, the death of over-the-air free broadcasting, which I think is a, a real abomination, and we'll get into that more. I know my time's expired, Mr. Chairman, and I, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Thank you uh, very much, um, uh, Mr. Walden. And uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, Chairman, for holding this important hearing. I'm going to waive opening statement. Look forward to hearing from the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Doyle. We will add uh, two minutes to your question time for our panel of witnesses. The gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Ensley, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for holding this hearing. We know how important this is, certainly in my state. As we speak, I've got hundreds, if not thousands, of constituents designing these new Internet and broadband services of the next generation. It's very important to a lot of my neighbors, people I represent. It's important to the country as a whole for its job creation possibilities. President Obama has recognized broadband infrastructure investment has tremendous job potential, but we know we're going to have to have additional allocation of spectrum for commercial use to really reach uh, the fruition of the tremendous promise here. And in order to first identify that spectrum, I want to commend Chairman Waxman for his inventory bill, which is a first step. I'm a, proud to be an original co-sponsor. Look forward to getting that, that done as a first step. But once the spectrum is identified and ready for auction, we really have to assure that procedures are in place, this time to adequately guide the auction process. In 2007, or in the 2007 Advanced Wireless Services Auction, the process and reporting requirements were insufficient to appraise the length, complexity, and size of federal relocation efforts. They also failed to ensure a timely transition of spectrum by federal agencies and business planning by commercial bidders. It's this very problem that the bill that the, I'm uh, prime sponsor and seeks to address. Fundamentally, our bill do two things. First, it increases the amount and quality of information available to potential bidders before an auction occurs. And second, it expedites the flow of auction proceeds to the relocating agency to keep the relocation process on track. I'm convinced that this more complete information about the affected federal agency systems the relocation cost estimates and schedules will reduce the risk for potential bidders, will ensure timely relocation payment and movement by federal agencies, and will ensure that the next generation of consumer demanded services are delivered. It will not cure the common cold, otherwise it sounds pretty good. I want to thank uh, my colleagues, Mr. Upton and Chairman Boucher, for their work on this, advancing this, and I look forward to moving this so that we can uh, really fulfill the promise of our brilliant constituents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ensley. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, holding this legislative hearing, and I look forward to uh, hearing our witnesses. Uh, we have to make sure that we do this right and in balance with the uh, spectrum that's used in the military. I have the pleasure of representing uh, the 55th Wing, which is an electronic warfare and information operation out of Offutt Air Force Base uh, right outside of Omaha and Bellevue. And I have a letter from the Association of Old Crows that set out some of the uh, issues that we may be discussing here with the spectrum. Uh, and I'd like to offer that letter into the record, Mr. Chairman. Uh, without objection. Then uh, last uh, in our committee memorandum, uh, it starts off with the uh, introduction criticizing the Universal Service Fund and calling it ineffective. Uh, and then the second paragraph also starts off with the uh, Universal Service. So uh, somehow Universal Service Fund is important uh, in this discussion. I'll look forward to your comments on how Universal Service Fund affects the spectrum and your usage of it. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Terry. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Matsui, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for calling this important hearing today. And I'd also like to thank today's witnesses for being with us today. We're here today to discuss how we can promote greater transparency on spectrum issues while expediting the process in which we can allocate additional spectrum in the marketplace. According to recent estimates, there are approximately 270 million wireless subscribers in the United States, but that number is growing. According to recent reports, 
The current economic recession has increased the number of consumers opting for only cell phones over traditional landlines. There is concern that the current allocation of spectrum for mobile bro broadband services is inadequate to meet the rapidly growing demand. In fact, the FCC recently warned of a potential spectrum crisis that could threaten the expansion of broadband services. While the DTV transition helped free up more spectrum, the need for commercial spectrum capacity will only expand as broadband continues to be delivered to more areas. To ensure transparency and help ensure we meet demand, Chairman Waxman and Boucher have introduced the Radio Spectrum Inventory Act, and Congressman Inslee and Upton have introduced the Spectrum Relocation Improvement Act. I am a co-sponsor of both pieces of legislation. Moving forward, spectrum availability will be key to ensuring competition, improve public safety, meet growing demand for wireless services, and any proposal going forward should ensure underserved urban communities are properly considered. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing today, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Matsui. The gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to welcome the panel that is before us today. We're delighted that you're here, and I'm also delighted, Mr. Chairman, that we are talking about legislation that actually represents what is a balanced give and take. And that is not something we often do in this Congress. All too often we're talking about taking from the American taxpayer and giving to big business. But today we're going to be talking about raising money from big business through an equal exchange of value for a commodity. And this represents good policy and good government, and I'm pleased we're having the hearing. As we plot a strategy on how we move forward on broadband and how to best utilize the spectrum, I'm one of many on this committee, as you have heard, who have long advocated for an effective and efficient inventory and assessment of what is available and how we best use it and how we best allocate it. I think it is important. Uh, Mr. Shemkus mentioned D-Block and uh, some of the work that needs to be done as we learn some lessons from that approach. Uh, we know that this is a robust industry. We know that well over 80 percent of consumers are happy with their wireless service according to a recent GAO study. That's pretty good. 80% of people like the product that is there and that is available. There is ample motivation to get as much information as possible on spectrum availability and evaluate all of our options for relocation. So I'm pleased we are bringing many different parts of this discussion together today, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Ms. Blackburn. The gentlelady, uh, I'm sorry, the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, is recognized for two minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening today's hearing on two bipartisan bills that are intended to make our, uh, to help our country make better use of our spectrum. H.R. 3125, the Radio Spectrum Inventory Act, will provide for the gathering of information about spectrum uh, use to increase transparency and help us understand exactly how the spectrum is now utilized. This is no small task, but it's absolutely essential to make informed decisions on allocating spectrum to meet the ever-increasing demand for wireless broadband spectrum. It has been reported that the U.S. allocation of spectrum compares poorly with OECD nations and is inadequate to meet the growing demand. We can't let that happen. We're going to do the best we can to help industry take lead uh, and, uh, and make our, uh, our nation lead uh, the world in, in broadband. H.R. Uh, 3019, the Spectrum Allocation Reallocation Improvement Act, streamlines the spectrum auction process and will reduce the time required to reallocate federal spectrum cleared for commercial use, allowing licensees to utilize their spectrum without unnecessary delay. As a co-sponsor of both of these bills, I recognize the importance of properly managing available spectrum. I also understand that the sponsors of H.R. 3125 are working with the Department of Defense to ensure that the bill also protects ongoing military uses of spectrum. I look forward to working with my colleagues to improve this legislation. I thank the witnesses 
for taking time to share their perspective on this legislation, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. McNerney. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, is recognized for two minutes. Oh, not here. Um, the um, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Booyer, is recognized for two minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask that my time be placed upon questions, and I welcome my friends Steve Largent and Gordon Smith. The gentleman will have added time for questions. The gentleman from uh, the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to also waive my opening statement and, and put it into the record. I'd like to welcome the witnesses, especially Senator Smith, who I believe is here for the first time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. The uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much for having this hearing. Uh, back in uh, 1993, we were in a world where there were two cell phone companies. They each charged about 50 cents a minute, and it was analog. Uh, but in, the, uh, uh, in 1993, this committee moved over 200 megahertz of spectrum. And uh, and we created the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth cell phone license. They all went digital. Uh, and by 1996, uh, the price had dropped to under 10 cents a minute. The first two companies had moved to digital as well. And we had a revolution that was ongoing. And it was so successful that right now, um, there are people sitting out here in the audience uh, checking their BlackBerry rather than listening to my opening statement. And, that, and that's a tribute. That's a tribute to what our committee made possible. And now we're on to the next stage uh, of this uh, revolution where uh, we know that uh, the Hulu, Google, eBay, uh, Amazon revolution is something that continues on. Uh, this committee should be very proud of it. Um, and that by reallocating even more spectrum, uh, we'll make it possible for uh, the entrepreneurs. We'll make it possible for these technology geniuses uh, to once again, again, brand a revolution made in America. Uh, we have to stay ahead of this curve. We have to make sure that uh, it is something that uh, is American. We did that in the 1990s. Uh, we have a chance to do it again. I congratulate you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for uh, your work on this issue. It, it was bipartisan then. It should be bipartisan again. Uh, we're into a wealth creation. That's what this is all about. And the more effectively that we can think this issue through, which is what you're doing, uh, is the more likely that we will create the, the greatest amount of wealth uh, that will help our country uh, become more prosperous. And I thank you for doing that. Thank you very much, Mr. Markey. The gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, is recognized for two minutes. Because it's impossible, uh, Mr. Chairman, to follow Mr. Markey, I'm going to submit my statement for the record and go back my time. Thank you for the hold. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space, is recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. In welcoming our witnesses, I too would uh, waive my opening. Thank you very much, Mr. Space. Um, that concludes opening statements from members of the subcommittee, and we now welcome our panel of witnesses this morning. We are pleased to have each of you with us today, and we very much look forward to your testimony. Just a brief word of introduction about each of our witnesses. Dr. Dale Hatfield is an adjunct professor with the Interdisciplinary Telecommunications Program at the University of Colorado. Steve Largent, former uh, member of the House of Representatives and former member of this committee, is the president and chief executive officer of the Cellular Telecommunications Industry Association, the Wireless Association. Mr. Michael Calabrese is Vice President and Director of the Wireless Future Program at the New America Foundation. Former Senator Gordon Smith, we welcome to this committee for the first time in his new role as President of the National Association of Broadcasters. And we look forward to a long and successful uh, partnership with you. Dr. Ray Johnson is the Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of the Lockheed Martin Corporation. And Mr. Thomas Straup is the Chief Executive Officer of Shared Spectrum Company. We welcome each of you. Without objection, your prepared written statement will be made a part of the record, and we would ask that you keep your oral summaries to approximately five minutes. Mr. Hatfield, we'll be happy to begin with you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Boucher and Rack. And if you could be sure that microphone is on and pull it very close to you, we can hear okay. you much better. Thank you. Chairman Boucher and Rack, Rack, Ranking Member Stearns and members of the subcommittee, I'm very pleased and honored to appear before you today to testify on the topic of radio spectrum management and in particularly on the issues raised by H.R. 3125 and by H.R. Uh, 3019. My name is Dale Hatfield. In addition to the position that you just mentioned, I'm also the executive director of the Silicon Flatiron Center for Law, Technology, and Entrepreneurship at the University of Colorado at Boulder. I should note in the past that I've engaged in uh, independent consulting activity, activities, including for some members uh, that are represented on the panel today. As I detailed in my uh, prepared testimony, I have other affiliations, but today I'm testifying entirely on my own behalf as a private citizen. Now, in my written testimony, I present some background on spectrum management and then focus on five overarching themes or points. It is those five points that I will briefly summarize now. First, I have been involved in, been involved in spectrum management issues for over four decades. And it's very clear to me that we are now at an unprecedented period of demand for access to spectrum in the critical frequency range of roughly 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. This increase in demand for spectrum is propelled by increases in the number of uses of the resource, in the number of users, and the amount of bandwidth or capacity consumed per user or use. While the exponential growth in commercial cellular bandwidth requirements is the most, perhaps the most visible, there are a host of other increasing demands for spectrums in this range as well, including ones that support, important ones that support public safety, homeland security, and national defense priorities. Thus, in my opinion, the spectrum scarcity issue that the legislation sets out to address is very real. Second, in my written testimony, I review five traditional techniques that we, that we have used in the past to accommodate growth and demand for the resource. One, going higher in frequency. Two, improving the technical efficiency of spectrum utilization. Three, reallocating existing spectrum from one use to another. Four, increasing the amount of spectrum sharing. And five, reusing spectrum more intensely in the, in the geographic dimension. I conclude that for technical reasons, going higher in frequency will be of limited utility in solving the current spectrum crisis associated with wireless mobile data applications. And that while further improvements in technical efficiency can help, they are apt to be inadequate in solving the problems associated with the orders of magnitude increases in spectrum demand. That leaves reallocation, increased sharing, and more intense frequency reuse, at least in some services, as potential service solutions, albeit ones with unique challenges of their own. Third, setting aside spectrum reallocation for the moment, I next focused on increased sharing and in more intense frequency reuse. With regard to the former, I comment favorably on past steps that the FCC has taken to encourage voluntary sharing of the resource through secondary markets. I go on to conclude that a combination of increased incentives or mandates for spectrum sharing, coupled with more decentralized, more opportunistic, and more technologically sophisticated techniques for accessing spectrum can be a significant help in avoiding the looming crisis. In terms of increased frequency reuse, I first note that it's not always possible because of the nature of some services. In other words, some services like radar require very high power operating over long distances, and therefore you can't reuse the spectrum on a geographic basis as easily. Uh, I also want to note that, uh, that the uh, spectrum reuse may be uh, constrained by the availability of, su of uh, suitable antenna locations and economic backhaul facilities. Fourth, I comment that I am a strong supporter of conducting the spectrum inventories called out in H.R. 3125, and hence for the legislation itself, because I am a strong believer in that old adage, you can't, measure what you, you can't manage what you don't measure. It's simply, it's that simple. I could go on to, I go on to conclude that a comprehensive and ongoing inventory is necessary 
to support two of the most promising of the three ways of averting a spectrum crisis, that is, reallocation and increased sharing. Fifth, I observe that while I am a strong supporter of conducting spectrum inventories, I also note, based on many years of experience, that there are potential shortcomings associated with a paper study, at least in some services. Therefore, I conclude that the inventory mandated in the proposed legislation should be augmented by selected field measurements to gain additional information on actual usage in those, band in those bands as identified as being the most promising for reallocation or increased sharing. That concludes my oral testimony, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to respond to any questions that you or the rest of the subcommittee might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Largent, we'll be happy to hear from you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to thank you and the ranking member and uh, say to all the members, uh, hope you have a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, hope you get there. So uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity also to share the wireless industry's views on the Radio Spectrum Inventory Act and the Spectrum Relocation Improvement Act. These bills are much needed bookends for a process that will enable additional spectrum to be made available for the wireless broadband initiative and other services. Today, the United States is the world leader in wireless broadband. While having less than 7% of the global wireless subscribers, the U.S. is home to more than 20% of global 3G subscribers. Our 112 million 3G subscribers are more than any other country and more than the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth countries combined. Additionally, the most advanced wireless devices, which are manufactured by global companies and could be launched anywhere in the world, routinely debut in the U.S. marketplace. As a pair of former NTIA administrators recently noted, the convergence of mobile wireless services and high-speed Internet access and the evolution of handsets from telephones to powerful handheld computers promises to transform the way we work, learn, deliver health care, manage energy consumption, and enhance public safety. The key to translating this promise into reality is access to more spectrum. CTIA believes there's an urgent need to identify additional spectrum that can be made available for wireless broadband and other advanced wireless services. By providing for a comprehensive and timely inventory of spectrum below 10 gigahertz, enactment of H.R. 3125 would represent an important step towards meeting rapidly accelerating demand and maintaining U.S. leadership in the global wireless marketplace. How much spectrum do we need? The ITU projects that by 2015, developed countries will need at least 1,300 megahertz of spectrum for commercial wireless operations. Since the United States currently has less than 500 megahertz of spectrum available for commercial wireless services, we have asked the FCC to identify additional spectrum that can be reallocated to help us meet the ITU's benchmark. Many of our trading partners are taking steps towards this goal, and the U.S. needs to keep up if we're to stay ahead. A properly constructed inventory effort is a sound place to start. The inventory is only the first step, however. Once the inventory is complete, policymakers must use it to, to reallocate spectrum for advanced wireless services. History demonstrates that it can take a decade or more to reallocate spectrum for commercial use and put such spectrum in the hands of providers of commercial mobile services, more than a decade. Given the exploding demand for mobile broadband, we must move more quickly than was the case with either AWS or 700 megahertz efforts. We simply can't wait until 2020 or beyond. We recognize there will be critics of the effort to move forward with an inventory and reallocation of spectrum. They will claim that carriers should be more efficient with the spectrum already available, that we can build our way out of the problem, <clears throat> or that we <clears throat> that we have already seen an expansion in the amount of spectrum available for commercial services through the recent AWS and 700 megahertz auctions. There are sound reasons why the subcommittee should dismiss these criticisms, and I've discussed these in my written testimony, uh, written statement. Finally, once an inventory is complete and spectrum is identified for reallocation and auction, the improvements to the spectrum relocation process proposed by H.R. 3019 will ensure that the relocation process works smoothly for all parties. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss these matters with the subcommittee. We look forward to working with you to ensure that the U.S. wireless industry continues to serve as an engine for jobs, economic growth, and the American competitive advantage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Largent. Mr. Calabrese. 
Good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the committee's leadership for taking up these two very complementary and important pieces of legislation on a notably bipartisan basis. A national goal of not merely affordable broadband access, uh, but of seamless mobile connectivity anywhere and any time will require an enormous increase in available spectrum capacity. The Apple iPhone has proven to be the canary in the proverbial spectrum coal mine. Advanced smartphones consume hundreds of times the bandwidth of ordinary cell phones. With sufficient spectrum, pervasive connectivity will rapidly become integrated as well in applications for sensing networks, mobile health monitoring, energy conservation, education, and more. This exploding demand and the continued focus on exclusive licensing by auction uh, has served to reinforce the conventional wisdom that spectrum is scarce. In reality, the only scarcity is government permission <coughs> to use spectrum, that is licensing. Spectrum capacity itself is very abundant. Even in the most valuable beachfront frequencies below 3 gigahertz, actual spectrum use measurements show that the vast majority of frequency bands are not being used in most locations and at most times. This gross underutilization of the nation's uh, spectrum resource should be an urgent concern. Spectrum is not only an immensely valuable and publicly owned resource, but it's one that's infinitely renewable every millisecond. That is why New America and the broader public interest spectrum coalition that we work with strongly support enactment of H.R. 3125, the Radio Spectrum Inventory Act. We agree that the, that the more comprehensive in inventory described in the House bill is needed. A more granular and comprehensive description of spectrum use in each market will assist policymakers, entrepreneurs, and, and technologists to propose new ways to enhance both access and efficiency. We also agree it is important to extend the inventory up to 10 gigahertz, uh, as the House bill provides. Spectrum mapping would help facilitate expanded access to broadband in at least three ways. Uh, first, by improving the functioning of secondary markets for license transfers and leasing. Second, it will, it will provide information on what it would take to clear some very underutilized bands for new uses. And third, and perhaps most important, it will reveal the far greater number of frequency bands that can be made available for shared access in discrete geographic areas at certain times of the day or year, or at certain altitudes or power levels. We expect rural areas to be the most likely and immediate beneficiaries of this mapping. The one shortcoming of H.R. 3125, in our view, is that, the invent is that an inventory of spectrum assignments should be augmented by actual spectrum use measurements, uh, as, uh, as, as Dale just mentioned. Measurements, and eventually a, spectrum, a system of spectrum use monitoring, can provide a more nuanced window into how, when, where, and to what extent bands are actually in use. We realize that measurements add a budgetary, budgetary cost. Fortunately, we believe appropriated funds are available over the next four years for a very robust implementation of the Inventory Act. As part of the Recovery Act, Congress appropriated $350 million for a, quote, comprehensive nationwide inventory map of the nation's existing broadband capabilities. Since NTIA will award less than half the available funding to the states for broadband mapping, Congress could clarify that a portion of the remainder be used to inventory the airwaves as well. We also strongly support H.R. 3019, the Spectrum Relocation Improvement Act. Nowhere is spectrum underutilization more evident than in many of the bands reserved for use by the federal government itself. While we support H.R. 3019, we also believe the legislation should be broadened to uh, take advantage of a critical opportunity to free up far greater spectrum capacity. H.R. 3019 would continue to limit eligibility for radio system modernization to agencies actually clearing off a set of frequencies. While only a tiny fraction of federal spectrum could be cleared and auctioned in the near future, a far greater number of bands could be shared more intensively by taking advantage of advances in smart radio technologies. Federal spectrum incumbents need the resources to take affirmative steps to enable more intensive access and band sharing by other users. 
This could be a real win-win for the military. New and upgraded federal systems could be designed and procured with the broader public interest and spectrum access in mind, and not only in the very limited case of a band being cleared uh, for auction. I'll stop there. Thank you uh, very much, and I'll be pleased to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Calabrese. Mr. Smith. Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Stearns, members of this honorable committee, it is indeed a pleasure and a privilege for me to um, be before you to speak a few thoughts uh, about Spectrum on behalf of the National Association of Broadcasters. First, NEB believes that any inventory spectrum should be comprehensive. Let's look at all the bands and all the services, including the federal government bands, and let's view how each service is using its existing spectrum. Second, our national priorities should recognize the value that free over-the-air broadcasting brings to every American. Broadcasting and broadband are not either-or propositions, as some suggest. I believe that's a false choice. Third, we should challenge all services to be efficient and innovative users of spectrum. Through our recent transitional to transition to digital, broadcasting has become more efficient. With your help, the transition was a resounding success, and the benefits are remarkable. In a digital world, Viewers receive many new programming streams and a wide variety of content and local news in high definition. It would be short-sighted to stunt that growth and dampen what is an even brighter future for broadcasting. If broadcasting is limited or eliminated, consumer investment and expectations in DTV receivers would be stranded. Consumers spend an estimated $25 billion in, DT, in D, HDTV receivers in 2009 alone. Millions of other Americans invested time, effort, and funds on converter boxes, and the U.S. government spent $2 billion to help them with this. The broadcasters spent an additional $10 billion to make the transition. For years, consumers have been promised that the digital upgrade would usher in a new era of high-quality television with new and more diverse programming, more channels, and a host of new services, all for free and over the air. If, as some advocate, that this all be done away with, consumers would realize none of these benefits. Through the DTV transition, broadback, broadcasters gave back 108 megahertz of spectrum. Broadcast television is the first wireless service to ever substantially reduce its spectrum use while providing an increase in services. Then there's mobile DTV. This year, the television industry adopted a new mobile digital television standard turning on the green light for manufacturing and implementation. And the results are nothing short of stunning. Members of the committee, this is a mobile, DTV, this is a mobile TV. Right now it's playing an, a program from NBC. There are seven channels in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area that are doing this. It's also a cell phone. And this combination of technologies is, I believe, the future of mobile wireless communications. It is not an exaggeration to say that you will soon be able to receive broadcast television signals on almost any device. This is a, an example. Soon your BlackBerry will be a TV. Your iPhone could be a TV. You name it, it's we're on the cusp of it. And to short circuit it now, it seems to me, would be very unwise. Broadcasting's ability, and this is very important to understand, broadcasting's ability to serve one to many in small bandwidth segments re is unique among all services. At moments of national 
significance or tragedy, when millions of Americans are seeking information, broadcasting is the most efficient delivery system. With each new viewer, broadcasters' use of, of spectrum becomes more efficient without any additional burden on spectrum. By contrast, with wireless broadband, each stream of content to every individual places an additional strain on, on the wireless network, clogging up the bandwidth. And there's more. For example, a company called SESME is working with broadcasters to provide a blended broadcast broadband system. If you haven't seen this, members, I urge you to do it. That system is more affordable, high quality, and an alternative, a more affordable alternative to, ca to cable and satellite. A comprehensive objective examination of spectrum allocation and usage is, is a worthwhile endeavor. Such an analysis, if done forthrightly and without bias, will demonstrate that broadcasters continue to be the effective custodians of our nation's airwaves. Many broadcast services have not been and cannot be efficiently replicated by broadband services. Broadcasters, for example, help to save lives through timely coverage of natural disasters and other emergencies, and by coordinating with local law enforcement officials via AMBER Alerts. Broadcasters have participated in the recovery of 492 abducted children. Mr. Smith, if you could wrap up, you're a bit beyond your time here. <clears throat> Let's not forget the concerns we all shared during the DTV transition. We spent a lot of time to get it right, and we did it so that economically disadvantaged, the elderly, rural, and ethnic minorities are not left out with access to critical news and information. And finally, Mr. Chairman, um, if my statement is in the record, I think it is important that when you consider highest and best use and you put all of these public values in, the value of broadcasting is self-evident. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. Dr. Johnson. Uh, Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Stearns, and members of this subcommittee, Good morning, and thank you for inviting Lockheed Martin Corporation to participate in today's hearing on the Radio Spectrum Inventory Act. My name is Dr. Ray Johnson, and I serve as Lockheed Martin's Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer. My role in the corporation provides me with a broad perspective of important spectrum issues relevant to the discussion today. I appreciate the opportunity to contribute, and I am honored to offer input that may help inform your consideration of these important policy matters. Lockheed Martin is a global security company that employs approximately 140,000 people in all 50 states. We are principally engaged in the research, design, development, manufacturing, integration, and sustainment of advanced technology systems, products, and services, and most of these systems and solution, solutions depend on access to the spectrum that we're discussing. Our customers include a broad array of agencies, both military and civil, for whom we support diverse critical security missions, both at home and abroad. At any given time, Lockheed Martin Corporation holds approximately 400 FCC authorizations for a variety of uses, including experimental license, licenses that enable the testing of new technologies as well as new applications being applied to existing technologies. As a general matter, spectrum scarcity is not a problem that is unique to FCC licensees. Based on our understanding, federal government users are experiencing the same pressure as they are required to meet increasing demands of their critical roles and missions. Therefore, it's an important balance that H.R. 3125 achieves by requiring an inventory of both federal and non-federal spectrum resources to be conducted by the FCC and the NTIA. Although our own activities, through our own activities in developing advanced systems and solutions to meet many federal government needs, we see growth in requirements in terms of access to bandwidth, bandwidth intensive applications, whether that's video streaming from an unmanned vehicle or surveillance from a high altitude airship. Lockheed Martin endorses the enactment of H.R. 3125, the Radio Spectrum Inventory Act. We do, however, have some concerns with the bill as it was introduced and respectfully suggest that the bill be modified to reflect the following issues. First, I note that the stated purpose of H.R. 25 is to promote spectrum efficiency. 
While the bill, bill does not explicitly require that NTIA and FCC conduct an efficiency analysis of spectral usage, the proposed Section 119A1E, as added by the bill, steers the agencies in that direction. However, there is no single metric that spans all communications and non-communications uses of the spectrum, which can be used for a point of comparison. The intensity of use metric is not correlated with effectiveness or efficiency for many spectral uses, users. Moreover, efficiency improvements should not be equated to the reduction in bandwidth utilized. Measuring spectrum efficiency using as a proxy the price entities are willing to pay for a license is also inappropriate. Many critical spectrum users deliver tremendous value to our country, most importantly to our national and homeland security, but do not directly generate revenues. Second, we are concerned that the bill would inadvertently require FCC and the NTIA to disclose sensitive information that should not be disclosed. This disclosure does not only impact the federal government, but also impacts some FCC licensees like Lockheed Martin. We agree with the administration's stated concern and note that from any information security perspective, it is very important to recognize that the release of individual unclassified data points can result in sensitive information being improperly disclosed when viewed more as an aggregate. Third, I would like to raise a concern to the subcommittee regarding the possible misinterpretation of the legislation in two ways. One is the potential inadvertent message that is sent to our allies in the international community given the scope of the frequencies being inventoried and the provision requiring recommendations for, reallocation for reallocation. The Department of Defense and the defense industry have worked hard to achieve an international spectrum harmonization to support allied interoperability. The other concern is the requirement for an annual review of spectrum. This review can create an impression of volatility and instability in spectrum allocations, thus impacting long-term research and development, acquisition, and the deployment of new systems and solutions. Suggestions of instability in spectrum access could result in a chilling effect on the long-term technology investments. Finally, we have identified a few technical issues with the drafting of the bill that we will submit separately to the staff. While I'm here today to address H.R. 3125, I would like to note that we do have some concerns with H.R. 3019 as well, and we would be happy to offer a follow-up discussions with the subcommittee. Mr. Chairman. I appreciate having the opportunity to testify. H.R. 3125 is a good start, and Lockheed Martin commends you and the other co-sponsors for identifying the need for spectrum inventory and for taking the initiative to draft legislation to address this issue. Uh, we hope that you will agree with our suggestions to improve the bill, and we look forward to working with you and the committee staff throughout the legislative process. I'm happy to answer any question that you have. When Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Johnson. You. Mr. Straub. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on the pending spectrum inventory and relocation bills. My testimony this morning will focus on two main points. First, to determine how and if spectrum resources are being used efficiently, a spectrum inventory and spectrum database must include data on actual spectrum utilization. Second, until a database is compiled and analyzed, we caution against jumping to any conclusions as to what's next for particular frequency bands because new technology presents spectrum access, access alternatives that have not existed until now. I've been involved in the wireless industry for over 25 years. In the early 1990s, I was president of the Personal Communications Industry Association, which helped the nascent wireless industry win the reallocation of fixed microwave spectrum for new personal communication services, which were the source of competition and innovation that were referenced by Congress and Markey. Then I founded and ran a company called Columbia Spectrum Management to facilitate and negotiate the relocation of fixed microwave incumbents in the PCS bands for the auction winners. Since March of this year, I've been the CEO of Shared Spectrum Company. Shared Spectrum is a small technology company located in Vienna, Virginia. Since the founding of the company in the year 2000, Dr. Mark McHenry has been conducting spectrum occupancy studies to document the untapped potential of many unused frequency bands. Attached to my written testimony is a list of our public studies to date. The video monitors in the room are also displaying some sample <clears throat> results of our measurements. These studies include measurements from New York City, Chicago, and Washington, D.C. during periods of anticipated high radio traffic. They indicate that less than a third of the allocated radio spectrum was being used at any given time. To take advantage of this empty spectrum capacity, SSC pioneered Dynamic Spectrum Access, or DSA, technology. DSA takes advantage of the empty spectrum capacity 
by adapting to the spectral environment and changing transmission or reception parameters. This allows for more efficient wireless communications without interfering or requiring the dislocation of legacy systems using the same bands. The company developed DSA over the past nine years for several military projects, and this technology is now being implemented in several military radio systems. We are also exploring several commercial applications, including new cost-effective cost rural wireless broadband systems that, that can access preferred lower frequencies. As has been pointed out throughout the hearing, the demand for spectrum across all sectors and markets is substantially increasing. We agree that the necessary first step in confronting the spectrum dilemma is to conduct a comprehensive study of the nation's spectrum resources. We are therefore pleased to support the Radio Spectrum Inventory Act. The bill would provide guidance to the FCC and NTIA to work together to create a database of spectrum allocations and assignments. However, it is also important to supplement this data with information regarding the actual use of the airwaves. Virtually every service to which spectrum is allocated can show a legitimate need for the spectrum and most incumbents will argue that they make effective use of their allocations. Thus, compiling a, a database of spectrum assignments will be interesting, but that alone will fail to show how much, or even if, the spectrum is actually being utilized. Until such a database is compiled and available, we caution against any presupposition as to what's next for a particular radio band. To assume that the next step following the initial inventory would be a traditional reallocation proceeding would amount to a plan for years and years of fighting among entrenched interests that have no notion or incentive to have their existing spectrum rights diminished, no matter how little they are utilized. This is based on my personal experience where it took six years for the PCS spectrum, spectrum to be reallocated, and that looked like the fast track compared to most reallocation efforts that typically have dragged on for more than 10 years. As the subcommittee moves forward, we believe that it is also important to recognize that new technologies like DSA enable more efficient use of existing spectrum allocations and can create new opportunities for sharing spectrum with the existing services in underutilized bands. The interest in finding additional spectrum for wireless broadband services is more likely to be accommodated in a timely manner if a flexible access framework is established that includes DSA-enabled sharing with government and non-government incumbents. Such a framework would focus on multipurposing legacy bands with flexible overlay rights and responsibilities. <clears throat> this approach is that <clears throat> approaches that involve repurposing certain bands and relocating incumbents would be too difficult, too costly, too, too time consuming, and in light of new technology, unnecessary. Instead, a better policy would build upon the approach taken when the PCS bands were made available in 1995. The licenses, the licenses that were auctioned were subject to a non-interference requirement with the existing microwave incumbents. While most of those licensees ultimately were relocated to new systems on other frequencies, the advances made in DSA and cognitive radio technology now provide the ability to coexist with legacy systems that was not available at that time. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. <clears throat> Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Straup, and thanks to all of our witnesses for your informative remarks here this morning. I particularly appreciate the broad consensus that is evident from your testimony about the need to move forward with both of the bills that are the subject of our legislative hearing this morning, particularly the need for an inventory of spectrum that could be reallocated for commercial purposes. Uh, a number of you, most recently Mr. Straup, just mentioned the potential of spectrum sharing as a way to accommodate new commercial services within our spectrum constraints. Could you talk a little bit about the state of the technology with regard to spectrum sharing and what potential really does it hold and what limitations does it face? And who would like to begin? Mr. Hatfield. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's. And uh, could you pull that microphone just a bit closer? Huh? I think there's uh, uh, sharing you can look at in two ways. It's important to look at in two ways. We have always shared a lot of this existing spectrum, and we call that static sharing. Uh, for example, a uh, an antenna pointed at a satellite, and a, an antenna is pointing on the ground or pointing in different direction, and that provides sufficient isolation that a satellite system can share with a terrestrial system. And that static short of sharing has been with us for quite some time and used effectively. I think the key here is combining 
the uh, concepts uh, that Tom talked about is that, the, that a lot of spectrum is not being used all the time today and look at more dynamic forms of sharing. In other words, uh, for example, here in town today in DC, a particular channel might not be used by some private industry, some private microwave, something like that. And that spectrum could be then shared on a dynamic on a dynamic basis. So I think the key going forward. So you're not talking about technology in that example that would use the same spectrum simultaneously by various users, but simply with a phased use of the spectrum by various users, each using it fully within that allotted time. Yeah, where they're using it, but not all the time. Uh, or, uh, as we can say, there may be a, a directionality or something that can be a, a employed that would allow dynamic sharing. So, uh, that's, that's given, given that opportunity, talk a little bit, if you would, about the state of technology development for actual simultaneous sharing of the same spectrum. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll be more than happy yeah. to field that. All right, question. Mr. Strout. Um, we have tested this on multiple occasions with members of the, the military and members of the public present. Uh, we're currently porting it over to several different radio systems. Our expectation is that those radios are going to be um, ready for testing next year and deployed into the field no later than the year. So there's nothing commercially available today that would enable simultaneous use of the spectrum by, uh, by multiple users, but you, you're saying this technology is under development and ready for testing potentially next year. I would suggest that it's beyond the level of testing. It is now being deployed into radio systems or being developed into radio systems. Uh, within the commercial sector, we have uh, initial licensing agreements with two different companies to use it within the TV white spaces. Our expectation is that upon conclusion of that rulemaking proceeding, the development of those rules at some time within the, eight, the next 18 months that it will be deployed. Uh, any, any other comments, Mr. Calabrese? Yeah, there are, <coughs> you, you know, as you've heard from, you know, uh, three of us, there is a, it seems to be a far greater opportunity in terms of quantities of spectrum uh, to open it up on a shared or opportunistic basis. And, and there are a couple important precedents, uh, at least to build on. You know, one I think you're aware of is, of course, the military already allows um, shared use of, ra of certain radar bands. So, uh, you know, thanks in part to the Jumpstart Broadband Act that was over on the Senate side some years ago, the military agreed to open up uh, the 5 gigahertz band based on a technology that, that uses, um, uh, y you know, dynamic frequency selection. In other words, the devices sense, the air, they sense before they transmit, and if they don't detect anything like radar, then they, they operate there and they keep checking, 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 and they can get off real quick. The, the other even more uh, important uh, technological, I think, precedent here to build on is the order last year from the FCC on the TV, opening the TV white space for unlicensed sharing. Because uh, what the commission has required is a, 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 a geolocation database. So these smart, these smart devices will need to have GPS and then an internet access. They look up and they get a list of available channels with conditions attached. And so we can build on that database that the commission's about to create and add a lot of other frequencies over time that would have conditions attached uh, to them. That's uh, very encouraging to hear. Uh, I would just note that the first commercial application of the white space technology is now occurring in my congressional district. Right. Um, one other question, my time has expired, but uh, I'll ask uh, if you have any brief comments about this. Are there shortcomings at the present time in the uh, licensing and spectrum management processes that are employed by both NTIA and the FCC. And if you detect that there are any, <clears throat> do you have recommendations for how those processes could be improved? Anyone want to answer, uh, Mr. Largent? I, I would just uh, repeat some of the problems that have t taken place in AWS spectrum with some of our members. Uh, as being a shortcoming that I think are addressed in both of these bills uh, and I think are a, a definite step in the right direction. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else want to briefly comment on that? Ms. Tratfield. I, I would add that the Commission has done things in the past to encourage a secondary market so that uh, one, one of the problems with the existing system, it's centrally controlled and, and therefore there's a lot of rigidities built into it. 
the commission to its credit has gone to the use of secondary markets where uh, companies or so forth can lease spectrum. And that has not worked out quite as well as, I th as some of us would hope. So I think there's, there's, there's possibilities to continue to encourage the secondary, secondary market to reduce some of the re rigidities associated with trying to centrally manage, uh, manage the resource. Thank We're you, Mr. Hatfield. Why, why the, the um, my time has expired. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Largent, uh, one of my questions for you is uh, when we had the auction on the DTV transition and we raised uh, about $19 billion, uh, the bill that uh, Mr. Barton sponsored and I was a co-sponsor, um, I think it became the backbone of the fourth generation wireless uh, service. Um, now, that was one approach. Now, the other approach appears to be the stimulus package. They put in $7 billion uh, to provide grants. And I guess the question would be, um, the auctioning of, of the spectrum, it appears to me, would be a more efficient way to do it than just giving out the stimulus package. You might comment on the two approaches here and which one you think is more advisable. Well, I, let me just say this. Uh, the bottom line is we need to have additional spectrum in the wireless space in order to meet uh, not only the demands but the promise, the hope of the broadband uh, world. And so however you get, a, you get to that point, uh, that's subject to debate and can be yeah. even become partisan. But uh, the bottom line is more spectrum is needed and uh, sooner rather than later. The fact is the last two uh, tranches of, of, of uh, spectrum that were allocated for wireless use, the AWS auction, 700 megahertz auction, both of those auctions took over 10 years to come to fruition. One was about 12 years, the other was 16 years to get it to come to fruition. And uh, our thought is, is this is really a process that we're uh, in, the, in the process of uh, developing today that should have begun years ago if it's still going to take somewhere between 12 and 16 years. So uh, I guess the bottom line is, is that uh, there's different ways to, to uh, get to the bottom line. But the important thing is to get to the bottom line, and that's additional spectrum for the wireless industry. Do members of your association, are they going to benefit from this uh, $7 billion in the stimulus package? It will be direct. Is it just, uh, I mean, I understand it's going to all go to develop the wire lines, but do, do you, do your companies see it as a positive? Uh, I would say that the majority of the money uh, that's been allocated is not going to uh, the companies that are in our association. Okay. You mentioned just briefly the chairman talked about uh, T-Mobile and, and then the spectrum reallocation. You sort of indicated the, the problem and the, the transition, and I mentioned my opening statement. Uh, I would think if we want other commercial carriers to compete and get involved, this would be uh, a flag to them that if it's going to take too long, they've got this investment, I think, of over $4 billion. I mean, how long can they continue to deal with that procrastination? So, I mean, you might give us some ideas on, on what could be done to, uh, to improve this reallocation time frame and uh, perhaps uh, what, what we in Congress should be aware of. Well, actually, the, the second bill that we're talking about today, uh, 3019, actually goes to that subject, uh, that once the spectrum's identified, the spectrum's auctioned, then uh, getting the people that are on the spectrum off the spectrum more expeditiously uh, is really helped by this particular bill that we're talking about uh, today. So, uh, you know, my hat's off to you. you, you I think Congress has, uh, so you think has do gone it. forward, made mistakes, recognized those mistakes, is now trying to correct them, and that's a real positive movement. And you feel pretty comfortable that will solve the problem? You, no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not positive it solves all the problems that are involved, but it solves the problems Big. that we know of. No. Uh, with the auction process that took place two, and, uh, two years ago. Uh, Mr. Hatfield, um, what steps could be taken to make more efficient use of commercial and government spectrum that's already deployed? In my, uh, in my written statement, I, I go through the list of sort of five techniques that can, can be used, and the two probably that haven't been talked about as much here is one uh, more technical efficiency. It's like getting more miles per gallon on your car. I mean, there's sort of two ways we can improve uh, our uh, transportation efficiency. One is by more miles per gallon, 
or by or by carpooling, for example. And sharing that we've talked about here is the carpool analogy, but we, we also need to look at ways of more efficiently uh, uh, using the spectrum, getting more uh, bits per second per hertz, as I would say in technical terms. And there's, two, there's a couple of ways doing that. One is through compression, reducing the number of bits that have to be sent. The other is using more, what we call more efficient, uh, tech, uh, more efficient modulation techniques. What scares me, what scares me as an engineer is those, those techniques only look like they can provide us with incremental improvements. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. We absolutely should because it's crucial. And they are happening. But the, but the difficulty is they're probably not going to be adequate. So that leads us then to the need for more sharing or, re, or, uh, re, or reallocation. The other way, just to complete the thought, is through more intense reuse of the spectrum. For example, when your cell phone, the tower may be two miles away, and therefore you're taking up uh, an area with a two mile radius, if you shrink the cell down, then you can reuse that same channel more and more times in a city like DC. So you can use the same channel several hundred times. And so you can see the cellular carriers have made enormous investments in more cell towers. That, that, that helps a lot. But as you keep getting the cells smaller, of course, then you have to get that information from the cell tower back to some central location. And that's where I believe your broadband policy of getting fiber out there intersects with the, uh, with the wireless industry because the wireless industry needs to get the wireless data back to their central point, and that requires a broadband facilities. So I think there's a real link here between what's do being done in the broadband policy and the wireless. Mr. Area. Chairman, I don't have any further questions, but I thought Dr. Johnson might want to comment if he wanted to on the same question. Uh, in the uh, commercial receiver standards, the military already has uh, these standards for radars, uh, but, but none of those standards exist for, uh, for commercial systems. So there may be opportunities to uh, take advantage of some of those standards that have been developed there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Stearns. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Chairman Dinkle, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome our panel, particularly Mr. Largent, our former colleague and friend. Welcome back. I have some questions. Since there's so many, I have to do this all in with yes or no's. Uh, Mr. Largent, yes or no. Uh, has CTI, uh, CTIA or anyone else conducted usage studies which measure actual traffic to see if the spectrum is being used? talking about the spectrum that's uh, been allocated for commercial mobile wireless? Uh, just, just have spectrum studies been, been completed to uh, tell us whether the spectrum is being used. I'm not sure I understand the question, sir. I, I, the, the, the spectrum Has anybody made any studies to find out if the spectrum is properly being used? CTIA, FCC? Anybody? Well, what I can tell you is that the commercial mobile wireless spectrum that we have available to this industry today is used more efficiently than in any other country of the world. Now, I'm going to take that as, as a no, and I thank you for that. Now, do all CTIA carriers operate at full capacity on their allotted spectrum today? No, sir. Uh, has FCC conducted any usage studies which examine whether the spectrum, either by your members or anybody else, is uh, being properly and adequately used with regard to that spectrum which is assigned to them? I'm not aware of any. Okay. Uh, so the argument seems, seems to be here, I think, that you have enough spectrum for now, but we'll need it 10 years from now or at some future time. Is that correct? Uh, we have enough spectrum for right now, but we'll need spectrum before 10 years. And, and, and I thoroughly agree with you. Our problem here is to see how we're going to get that, that uh, spectrum efficiently allocated, because as you'll remember from your time in this committee, we had a serious problem with regard to the fact that the spectrum was just thrown out on the, uh, by the FCC and by the government to be sold for budgetary reasons as opposed to addressing the proper use of the spectrum. Now to all witnesses starting on, on your uh, right and my left, uh, how do you view HR 3125 uh, and HR 3019? Do you view it as complementary? 
to the FCC's uh, work to develop a national broadband plan, yes or no? Uh, starting on your far right, if you please, sir. Uh, simple no, and yes or no answer, yes. Mr. Largent? Yes. Sir? Uh, yes, very much. Sir? Uh, the answer is yes, but believe it could be expanded. Uh, next witness, please, sir. No. No? And, and the last witness? Yes. Now, if the completion of national broadband should be delayed pending enactment uh, of H.R. 3125 and H.R. 3019, how long should such delay be? Starting again on your far right and, and my far left. How long should such a delay be? How long, how long could or should that delay be? Uh, I think the... Uh I think the, uh, the requirement is so great that we do not want to wait pending uh, moving, taking some of these steps pending the uh, inventory. Mr. Largent? And I would agree with that. The sooner the better. Next witness, please. Yeah, likewise, there are, there are bans and, and things. How, how long should right the delay be while we wait for those studies to be completed? One year. Sir? Next witness. Uh, Chairman Dingell, uh, the answer is uh, delay is not good, but, de but delay is uh, uh, frankly better if, if you don't have the right information. So if you need the right information, delay is maybe necessary. But See, I'm no, special, I'm no special pleader for delay. My concern is that if we do this, we do it well. And I'm not satisfied that up until this time we have been doing these things well. And I'm very much troubled that we will expand that bad history by, again, doing things poorly. Um, I, winding agree up with, 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 with a mess on our hands because we have built upon a, a faulty edifice. Uh, next witness, sir. We would recommend f moving forward with the spectrum inventory, including the, uh, the, me the actual measurements, which will help identify bands that are particularly useful for spectrum sharing. All right. Um, Mr. Chairman, I note I'm four minutes or four seconds over my time. I yield back with thanks to you. Thank you uh, very much, Chairman Dingell. The gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you for this hearing. I want to thank the witnesses for uh, your testimony as well. All of you, I especially Dr. Johnson, appreciated your technical counsel on uh, the legislation as well. Um, Senator Smith, I want to go to you uh, regarding uh, this notion uh, put forth uh, by the uh, distinguished scholar in residence at the FCC for First Amendment and Spectrum, Dr. Benjamin. In his paper, and this is just from May of, of this year, he writes, the most obvious desirable regulations are probably those that are pure dead weight loss, regulations that cost broadcasters significant amounts of money but have no impact on their behavior. This category would include onerous record keeping requirements, ascertainment requirements, etc. These are unlikely to have any impact on programming and thus will likely be pure cost. His thesis is in this paper, which I'll ask unanimous consent to put in the record, called Roasting the Pig to Burn Down the House, a modest proposal, um, is to make it so costly on broadcasters that they surrender their spectrum. And I, I find it an abomination. I find it offensive. I don't quite understand why he's now in this position at the FCC, and I'll follow up on that. But given the fact that we just went through a $2 billion DTV conversion and you're on the cusp of a digital television technology that is mobile and you make the argument in your statement about how uh, uh, every new subscriber to that free over the air digital mobile service makes that even more efficient because you're not adding to the stream. If, if we follow uh, Professor Benjamin's uh, counsel or the FCC does, aren't we just throwing that $2 billion into a paper shredder? Congressman, yes, you're uh, throwing $2 billion of U.S. taxpayer money away. You're throwing uh, away potentially uh, untold billions that, that uh, U.S. citizens have um, spent in detrimental reliance upon the uh, uh, con congressional urging of the, of the digital transition. Um, yeah, um, suffice it to say, my phone has been ringing off the hook 
uh, ever since uh, this gentleman's work is, has uh, been revealed. Uh, that said, I think what uh, he does is simply try to monetize highest and best use in pure dollar terms, disregarding all the other public values that are served through localism, local news, local sports, local weather. Um, these are things that I think, uh, you know, particularly when it comes to emergency uh, information, amber uh, alerts, I don't know how you monetize that. And uh, I'm hesitant to say it, but when it comes to broadcasting and the broadcast airwaves, they've always been a public option <laughs> to make sure that everybody gets served. And uh, he seems to be uh, suggesting that that maybe should be yesterday. All right. Dr. Johnson, I raised uh, the issue in my opening statement about uh, the amateur radio broadcast service, and I failed to disclose that uh, Mr. Ross and I are the two licensed amateur radio operators, which gives us license to be real hams and uh, <laughs> politicians. And, and I'm just curious, as you look at the spectrum from a technical perspective, what should amateur radio uh, licensees uh, be concerned about, and uh, what threats and, and uh, value do you see in that spectrum? Yeah, I, uh, I won't be able to give you uh, a full detailed answer uh, because I have not looked at that particular issue in detail. I do, I would support, however, and I also am a ham radio operator. Oh, very uh, good. So I would support, uh, however, uh, your thesis that uh, the ham bands uh, have been an important backup system for the nation's security. Uh, and I think they're also a valuable resource uh, for citizens who have an interest in, in, in that kind of technology. and. Uh, although there are other uh, avenues to uh, address those same issues now outside of the ham bands, I think they're still important, and, and yeah. we'd be happy to look at the technical details yeah. of uh, the challenges to that particular band. All right. Mr. Hatfield, do you have any comment on the amateur radio band? And tell me you're a ham radio operator, too, uh, would you? I, you know, I think my license just expired, but I started, the way I got into this business is starting as a ham, and I was, I think, 13 or 14 years old, something like that. I, I think the problem that the amateur radio community has is that they do provide a very, very vital final sort of backup communication right. network. And it's just absolutely, it's totally decentralized, so there's nothing central that can fail. And that's really critical. The problem is that if you tune across the bands, so often they're idle. And if somebody was really clever, maybe we could figure out ways that we could do a little bit of sharing there that would not diminish the amateur opportunity at all for use in emergencies, but in non-emergency times might, might be used for some other vital uh, uh, public interest uh, uh, purposes as well. All right. And Mr. Chairman, I know my, uh, my time's expired, and I'm going to excuse myself. Mr. Booyer's going to take over for our side. We have a classified briefing with the, the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense on Afghanistan and Pakistan that I'm going to go to. So again, I thank you for your testimony. I look forward to working with all of you and others on this issue as we move forward in a, a thoughtful and constructive way on appropriate use of spectrum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Walden. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Booyer, is recognized for seven minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Booyer, if you can withhold. Um, I need to go in order here. The gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, is recognized for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be brief here. First of all, I want to thank the panel. I, I found the testimony very informative. Uh, and uh, I didn't hear anyone say, well, no, I don't like this legislation. I think Dr. Uh, Johnson had a little reservation about some of the definitions, so I appreciate that. Uh, and I'm going to ask you in a minute uh, to expand on that. But first I want to say, uh, expanding the, um, the range to 10, megahertz, uh, 10 gigahertz, there was, seemed to be a disagreement between Mr. Calabrese and Mr. Hatfield on that. Um, and I'm not sure exactly why you would think that going up to 10 gigahertz isn't that useful, Dr. Uh, Mr. Hatfield. Is it Dr. Hatfield or Mr. Hatfield? Uh, my uh, doctor is honorary, so... Okay, well, that's good enough for me, <laughs> Dr. Hatfield. <laughs> Get a little squishy about using it too much. Uh, but uh, I, I think the, I think the uh, answer is, there may be some confusion, it's, it's the range up to a roughly 3 gigahertz that's really critical to people like the cellular industry. So that's the most critical. On, on, on the other hand, if some of, the, some of the services we might want to relocate 
could go higher, it would still work okay if they went higher in frequency. So therefore, I think and make an argument that we ought to look all the way up to 10 to see if there's any opportunities, for example, that some could be re reallocated from below. So there are, there are physical limitations after three, say, line of sight and yeah, so that, on? That, that, that's yeah, cor that's correct. For mobile applications, now for certain radar applications, for example, being up there where you have line of sight, it might work perfectly fine. So that, that's what okay. I think is, the, uh, is perhaps the basis for the difference. I would support going up higher for that purpose, but, but we mustn't kid ourselves. There's limit, technical limitations sure. that would prevent it from being okay. used for certain applications. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Johnson, um, you did mention the, uh, the idea that uh, there's no single metric for efficiency. Do you have, uh, is there anyone out there that you're aware of or that would be useful or a sort of a set of definitions uh, we think that um, a single definition uh, like intensity of use is, is not appropriate. We propose using a variety of metrics that correspond to the critical parameters related to the particular system and application that's being used. For example, uh, metrics for communication systems would be different than those for radar system. So you'll, are you going to supply the committee with that information? We would be happy to, pleased to work with the committee to develop okay, those be metrics, absolutely. Anxious to, to work with the committee on, on examining that um, metric definition. Uh, the last thing I have is uh, the, the notion that the paper inventory isn't going to be adequate. Uh, and I didn't quite appreciate that. You know, I come from a technical background and I was a test engineer and a field tester. Uh, but then when, when Mr. Straub showed the, the the graphs with all those blank spaces, uh, people that own Spectrum are going to want to say, well, geez, we use all of it. We don't need to reallocate. And so we're going to need to actually do quite a bit of testing to validate. Uh, it seems to me like a fairly, just on the basis of what was spoken here this morning, a fairly big task to, to really judge how much Spectrum is available out there. So could you comment on that? Yes, Congressman, we submitted some suggestions in our written testimony as to some short-term approaches as well as longer-term approaches. We'd recommend approximately 10 to 20 stations supplemented by uh, mobile testing and over a longer period of time and a larger number, perhaps in conjunction with universities and other organizations, to be able to compile an ongoing inventory of, of how the spectrum is actually being used. I mean, that, that's, that's going to take a lot of resources, a lot of time, and a lot of money. I mean. Uh, uh, even what you've called a shortcut seems like a fairly big uh, undertaking. I believe that uh, the, the NTIA and other organizations, the National Science Foundation, are already compiling this information. So some of it is there. Our, our uh, studies, or many of our studies, are already available uh, publicly and, and can be integrated into this database. So. Um, it's, it's not as large an undertaking as it may seem, but I do agree that uh, over a long term, and there's a great deal of data that will be, will be compiled. Uh, the National Science Foundation, or excuse me, the uh, Illinois Institute of Technology is actually conducting ongoing studies in Chicago. They have over two terabytes of information that's already been collected okay. from that location. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Calabrese? I mentioned in my written statement that the, the costs are really coming down for doing this. So, for example, Ofcom, which is the, you know, the British uh, telecom regulator, uh, recently completed a nationwide drive test of their airwaves. They, they mount measuring devices on, just on the rooftop of, of a national vehicle fleet, which we could do with the Postal S Service or whatever. And then, you know, that gets downloaded over Wi-Fi. Um, there's also very inexpensive devices now to have a mesh monitoring network. That's being field tested in the D.C. area uh, fairly soon by a company. We're hoping to have one on, our, on the roof of our building downtown. Okay. Uh, my time's expired, um, Mr. Hatfield, if you have a very quick response. Just I'd say in, in my written testimony, I, I said one of the things we can do is focus on those bands which look the most promising. So mm -hmm. do the measurement first on the mo most uh, uh, promising. Second, uh, well, why don't I just stop there and give them. Okay. I guess it comes down to the, the one of our favorite presidents saying, trust and verify. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. McNerney. The gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Boyer, is recognized for seven minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Largent, are you familiar with this latest GAO uh, report that came out titled FCC Needs to Improve Oversight of Wireless Phone Service? I've not read the entire thing, but I've, I'm aware of it. Um, are you aware of the uh, recommendations of GAO? Uh, GAO recommended that the FCC, number one, improve its outreach to consumers about its complaint process related performance goals uh, and measures in monitoring complaints. Number two, 
develop guidance on federal and state oversight roles, and three, develop policies for communicating with states. Are you familiar with the three recommendations? Well, I'm more familiar with the, 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 the facts that they uncovered first that was in that report that showed that 84 percent of... Well, that's where I'm going. You're getting ahead of me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Well, th well, let's just go right there. I mean, that, the, what I'm asking is they, they, they have these recommendations based on, and so I want to ask you to comment about what they're based on. I mean, my gosh, when we look at all the, all the choices that consumers have here going into the Christmas shopping season and the levels of satisfaction, would you please comment on the basis and the facts that they relied upon for these recommendations? Well, I, I think um, <laughs> it's not the way I would have written the report based upon the, the uh, uh, statistics that they found in the study. Uh, knowing this industry as I have for the last six years and seeing the uh, consumer complaints decline every year and the consumer satisfaction go up every year, uh, we feel like that that's a movement in the right direction. 84% approval by our consumers is not good enough for us. We're, we continue to, to uh, want to raise that even more, but it's a heck of a, uh, a heck of a uh, positive mark for the industry. Uh, and and you know, I hope to be able to sit before you in a year or two and be able to talk about how we're no longer at 84%. We're even higher today. But uh, you know, I, I think I think that the report did highlight some things that the FCC can be about. Uh, that would improve their service, um, but uh, the, the bottom line is is that it, it was a, uh, it, I think it's a star for the wireless industry to show the improvement of our service for our customers. In regard to your member companies when they make strategic judgments in competition, wouldn't consumer satisfaction be one of those important elements? Absolutely. It's, it's the key uh, statistic that they look at all the time. You know, I, I get excited when I, when I listen to my good friend, Mr. Markey, um, uh, share his excitement about competition in the marketplace. <laughs> and uh, so I would share with my good friend, Mr. Markey, that uh, what, we, when you rejoice uh, in competition in the marketplace and what is, it is bringing consumers relative to choice, do not be so eager to, to get more government control if in fact the marketplace is driving cons consumer satisfaction. The other point I, I'd like to, if I would have a little latitude, uh, Mr. Congress, or Mr. Chairman, because I'm also co-sponsor of this legislation, I'd like to kind of shift gears and, and, and turn to uh, uh, Mr. Smith and ask uh, a particular question. And matter of fact, it may drive, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I, I think we should uh, take a really good look here at uh, Comcast and NBC. So I'm going to ask a question about Comcast and NBC, uh, Mr. Smith. I have, uh, um, I've got cons some concerns about your member companies out there. I've got concerns about consolidation in the marketplace. I've got concerns about what type of new business model does this bring? What is its impact and how does it drive a new model for advertising? You held up your phone and you talked about this as a multimedia platform. As we have a marketplace, as you try to judge into the future, it's all about individualizing of advertising. And I can almost see as if we're, we are going to permit the marketplace to begin to mine and profile people that pretty soon even advertising, how it's even driven not only upon a web, you can almost have individualized advertising occurring upon TV. So as I try to think about into the future and how a vertical integration is this kind of deal when you have this many eyes of Comcast and being able to control content, it almost turns our present business model inside out, upside down. I welcome your comments on mine. Congressman, um, some of my members are for it. Some of them are very concerned about it, and I'm with my friends. <laughs> Uh, Very good, Senator. Uh, <laughs> uh, the NAB has not taken a position on this at this juncture. We, will, we are simply uh, going to watch and see what kind of conditions develop, uh, but we are very attuned to the issue and the problems that you uh, just cited. You know, the Supreme Court long ago talked about the importance of having a, um, a real diversity out there among our media, and that was back in the 1940s. 
um, with regard to ideas. I mean, if I were one of your member companies, and I'm a small company, and I have a couple of NBC affiliates, maybe a CBS affiliate, do, would, would, can't you relate to their concerns even about retransmission rights and fees and what impact is that going to have? Or upon others, wh whereby uh, is there going to be cost shifting because of this uh, vertical integration? Well, I, obviously I'm more than interested. I, I answer their phone calls because, yes, they are concerned with the very issues that you identify. Um, but I assume that the FTC, the FCC, and the Department of Justice will look at all of these things and propose conditions if this is to go forward at all. And at this juncture, it is the feeling of the association that we should uh, allow the process to work. One of, the, um, one of the concerns I have, Mr. Chairman, and why I would encourage to place your eyes and considerations on this issue is, um, is defined by the silence. When there is silence in the marketplace because of this type of deal, that tells me that there is great concern in the marketplace and fear that if, in fact, a company were to come out and come against this type of, of merger, what type of repercussions in the marketplace would, in fact, occur. So the fact that there's silence out there is beginning to bother me, Mr. Smith, that a lot of your member companies, while they may confide in that phone call with you, that there's a reason that they're not coming out publicly because they don't want to get jammed uh, in their negotiations. Is, am I close here? Well, I, I think they're very uh, interested observers of this uh, process, and uh, they share the concerns you've expressed. Um, uh, again, we have uh, networks. We have affiliates. Uh, they are, have most issues in common, but this is one where um, there needs to be Right. be an accommodation, um, an understanding, and a legal structure put in place that uh, allows both to survive. Well, and Mr. Chairman, I, just did, I just encourage us to put our, put our eyes to have a better understanding so we could try to see over the horizon the impact that this type of merger is going to have on a multimedia platform and advertising model. Thank you very much, Mr. Booyer. Let me assure the gentleman that our subcommittee will conduct at least one hearing on the Comcast NBC acquisition at the appropriate time next year. Uh, that announcement has already been made, and the gentleman is quite right in expressing the need for us to focus on this very carefully. It is certainly our intent to do so. The uh, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize to our witnesses uh, for not being able to hear their testimony. I was in with constituents and. Uh, I had to take a couple other meetings. But Mr. Largent, I have a question for you. Recognizing the challenges that Congress and the FCC will face in trying to relocate as much spectrum as possible, are companies within the CTIA exploring the possibility, the possibility of that a dynamic spectrum access that Mr. Hatfield suggested as a possible solution? I would say our companies are at, at a point where they're exploring every uh, opportunity, every option that's available to them, uh, in, including how to utilize their own spectrum that they currently have, use it more efficiently, uh, and look at every other avenue that's available to them in the years ahead uh, to, to uh, access more uh, spectrum. Is any of the companies within your organization using the dyna dynamic spectrum access? I mean, are any of them trying to borrow, if you will, during a peak time uh, surrounding system? Yeah. Is that going on now? I'm, I'm sure they're, they're looking, as I said, at every option that's available to them. Okay. Uh, Mr. Smith. Yes. Good, good to see you, and uh, thanks for being here. Let me ask you this one. I think it's important that we uh, look for or search for a solution to the spectrum crisis that preserves free over-the-air broadcasting while fostering wireless broadband deployment. In your testimony, you cite how the use of white space spectrum in rural America is a way to support both of these public interest goals. Is this solution workable in urban centers as well? It, it may well be. However, um, we do have a concern about um, interference and want to make sure that we don't degrade um, other signals. Let me ask you this. Has NAB conducted any studies to show how much spectrum is needed to fulfill future business plans of uh, like mobile TV, multicasting, and HD television? Have you done some studies? We are doing a study right now on that very question um, because we understand the importance of this issue and want to have the, the best information possible. Any idea when that study may be done? I don't have a date, but I will 
I'll get that to you, Congressman. Okay, thanks. Um, Mr. Hatfield, we, we talked a little bit about the spectrum crisis, and uh, is it only, do we only have to worry about that for the high population centers, or is this a national issue? Uh, I mean, in my rural area, we have a lot of places we don't have anything, so. Yeah, I, I, exactly. It is primarily a large urban area issue, and even within that, urban area, there, there are some real, real hot spots. The example would be a football stadium on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, having said that, I think I tend to divide the, market, divide the problem into two parts, and that is the urban problem and the more rural problems. And, and we need these more dynamic ways to be able to use the spectrum in the rural areas that's not, not needed uh, because of the lack of, of uh, population density. Well, let me ask you this. Is, is more access to spectrum the only issue the FCC and this committee should be focused on, or are there other e efficiency gains that can be explored with next, check, next uh, generation smartphones? Uh, as I indicated in my uh, written testimony, I, I don't hold out an awful lot of hope for some of the traditional solutions for the major, ur major urban areas, but there are, there are certainly the examples that I, that I gave, uh, like uh, compression and so forth, that we sure. should, be, uh, should be pursuing. But I don't think they solve, those technical solutions solve the problem completely. Well, if we start using these smartphones, wouldn't the manufacturers sort of help alleviate some of these problems we're going to see with trying to free up more spectrum? Can, can that be a solution? Can, can we find it more in manufacturing as opposed to the FCC and government? Uh, I... Uh, I don't see how the handsets by themselves can do an awful lot to improve, with the exception of the sort of dynamic spectrum access where the handset is smart enough that it's looking around to see what other spectrum might be available, available. and moving to it. So we can use the intelligence in the handset to find additional spectrum. I'm not sure how intelligence in a handset will improve the efficiency of existing spectrum use uh, beyond sort of incremental improvements. Okay. Mr. Calabrese, did you want to add something on that? Yes. I, you know, I, I talk in my, in my written statement about the importance of, uh, of encouraging hybrid networks because, as, you know, as Dale said, the, uh, you know, we're reaching the limits, the technical efficiency limits. We're also reaching limits in terms of how close the carriers can bring cell sites and backhaul to the consumer. So you need to shrink the cell size, get more reuse. And one way to do that is right now we have, um, you know, pending in, at the FCC, our rules to extend the Carter phone device choice okay. uh, to wireless. And when consumers have the choice of any device, the devices increasingly will be of a, of a type that they'll decide on the fly, what's my, what's my most economical path and, and mo in most cases, that will be like in a place like this, at home, in offices, and public spaces, it will be th over unlicensed spectrum into local uh, backhaul, into consumer-provided backhaul, and that will offload a lot of traffic mm. from carriers. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Stupak. The uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, is recognized for five minutes. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, very much. Mr. Hatfield, um, you, uh, you're talking here about uh, capacity for uh, dynamic sharing of a spectrum uh, <clears throat> so that we can make more efficient use of currently allocated spectrum. What percentage of our spectrum needs do you think can be satisfied just by uh, use of uh, dynamic sharing? I've not looked at it on a, uh, I've not looked at it uh, candidly uh, in a sort of quantitative, quantitative way. But I think, uh, I think you, well, I'm not going to answer you very satisfactorily, but I think it's sufficient enough that would help be of significant, it would be a significant help. I don't think it gets us all the way there. Yeah. So what you're talking about here is uh, something which is supplemental to what the needs are going to be in the future, but not a substitute for transfer of spectrum in order to deal with the issue. Is that right? Uh, I, I guess I would put it slightly different. I think we're probably going to need to use all of these d different techniques. Yeah, well, that, that's, yeah. 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 I, I use polysyllabic words to put it in very simple English. Um, I'll have to use everything. So the, uh, do you agree with that, 
uh, Mr. Lodgett? This is a it reminds me a little bit of a discussion of CAFE standards, you know, improvement of efficiency of vehicles or appliance efficiency, where we just think, can we use new technology here to, uh, to uh, get uh, better efficiency out of these automobiles or out of the, um, uh, out of the um, appliances which we use? But at the same time, you also want to do the research you know, on all new technologies, you know, all electric vehicles, whatever, to, to move out of the old technologies. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. How do we get the additional spectrum, but also squeeze out the maximum efficiency out of the old technology? So how do you view it, Mr. Lodgen? Well, I would say that I have a chart here this, that we, uh, I'll submit for the record and, and give to you uh, if you'd like to look at it. But it, it basically talks about how efficient uh, different countries utilize the spectrum available to them. And in the U.S., uh, we have 270 million consumers, uh, and we use per megahertz 660,000 consumers per megahertz of spectrum used. And that is the most efficient, by a factor of at least two, of any other country, save, New Me save Mexico, actually. Uh, they have 79 million users there. But um, it, it, we absolutely are using our, our, our spectrum available to us in the most efficient way possible, uh, and sometimes by magnitude of two. Okay. Um, Mr. Smith? The, your question to us is about, uh, about, the, about this balance between squeezing efficiencies out of the old technology uh, as opposed to moving over a spectrum um, to, uh, uh, to well, augment what we now have allocated so that we can maximize the um, the wealth generating opportunities. I, I think it's one of the miracles that we have before us is how much more efficiently we're using the spectrum now and certainly broadcasting has, uh, has invested uh, billions to, to achieve that efficiency. I, I do believe, and uh, because of, we've seen the explosion of technology you spoke of at the beginning of the hearing, Congressman, that there are going to be compression technologies that will uh, provide some of the answer here so that we can preserve the broadband and the broadcast um, uh, values that, that the committee seeks to, to serve. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Johnson? Uh, uh, yes, Congressman, I'd like to make a couple comments. Uh, first of all, uh, the Department of Defense, one of our principal customers, has hu huge, is driven toward increasing efficiency. Uh, we mentioned uh, briefly in my testimony uh, the use of unmanned aerial systems and streaming video and the intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance needs uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan that are driving that efficiency as they are with the commercial market. Uh, Lockheed Martin has developed spectrum management tools that are being used by our customers to increase that efficiency. But I'd also like to point out that in the federal, non-federal uh, kind of binary view of things, it's really not that. It's not a binary, binary view at all, at all because it's important to realize that the department is a major consumer of commercial equipment and using commercial um, systems, both terrestrial and space. So, so they have to uh, balance that accommodation between commercial and, and federal needs. Uh, Thank you. 20 seconds, Mrs. Trump. Yes, I would emphasize that uh, the military is deploying dynamic spectrum access. It is being built into several military radio systems. Going back to the question about utilization, emphasizing the point that you made regarding the PCS uh, allocation proceeding, um, that spectrum was encumbered by over 1,500 microwave paths, uh, which ultimately the, the PCS licensees received that via auction with the understanding that they could not interfere with them. And we're recommending building on that model, being able to utilize the technologies available today where they may not actually have to be relocated, but actually could share the spectrum. Yeah, I think we have to be inflexible in terms of the goal which we're trying to reach here, but flexible in terms of what the final combination looks like. Uh, but I think it will involve, obviously, substantial portions of both here, increased efficiency and more spectrum uh, as well. And we have to ensure that we encourage both to be maximized um, so that we do make ourselves uh, as competitive as a nation as we can, looking over our, our, our shoulders at number two and three and four in the world, as you said, uh, Steve, you know, so that uh, we maintain this lead. So we thank you all very much. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Markey. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, is recognized for seven minutes. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to start by uh, thanking all the witnesses, but especially uh, I want to thank Dale Hatfield uh, for his years of dedicated public service and his assistance to policymakers in helping people across the country to better understand the technologies behind these issues. I've never had a chance to tell him that personally, and he's here, and I want him to know that. So thank you, Mr. Hatfield. 
Um, Mr. Largent, uh, Mr. Smith, you both talk a lot about mobile video broadcasting. And I'm curious, do you think people want to watch a limited number of channels at a set schedule on a device about this big? Or do you think they want to watch their choice of programs when they want to watch them? And should that consumer preference drive spectrum decisions? Well, I, I would say <laughs> that from uh, my personal experience, the older I get, the harder it is to watch television <laughs> on, a, on a handset. But, uh, you know, we're, we're serving closer to probably now 280 million customers uh, in this country. Uh, will probably be the statistic at the end of this year. And uh, I, I would say that there, there probably is uh, consumer uptake of that, that particular service uh, as it becomes available and as it is available now. Mr. Smith? Uh, Congressman Doyle, I, I don't believe they should be regarded as exclusive. I think we can do both. And um, I, I, th I know young people are highly interested in, in mobile TV, and I suspect many um, um, who don't have to wear these are as well. Um, that, that said, I, I, I think it's very important that these new inventions like Hulu coming along, they're using broadcast content. Um, it won't be many years until your, your laptop will have a broadcast signal, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, it's not either or. It's, it's both. But it seems to me, and I, and I agree with that, I think it's young people, because I, I, I couldn't watch TV on this either, but uh, it seems to me those same people are the ones that don't want a set schedule. They, they want to watch their show when they want to watch their show. Uh, and and uh, that being the case, you know, as we talk about where's the best place to allocate spectrum, uh, it, it just, <laughs> yeah, it's, I just saw a note here, I, I want to watch the Steelers beat the Seahawks in real time. <laughs> right, right, right now the Steelers aren't beating anyone, so. <laughs> and, yeah, Eddie, were you responsible for that? <laughs> and but, Congressman, to that point, I mean, I, I hear your point, and but I also hear Congressman Markey's point. I, I hear people yeah. say, "No, I want to watch it when it's really happening," and um, uh, it's just part of being the American tradition. Particularly when it comes to sports, people right. uh, are very anxious to see it live, real time. Yeah, Mr. Hatfield. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your kind remarks earlier. But I, I think, as an academic, stepping back from this, you've asked the very, very fundamental question. If people want to watch content simultaneously, then that broad, broad, old broadcast model is a very efficient way of doing it. If people want to watch individual things, then the more cellularized approach is more efficient. So I look at, at here, your decision or our decision is is what what how that balance should be how that balance should be made. And of course, on the broadcast side, we probably have this additional uh, public interest. Uh, uh, benefits that generally broadcasting that may sway the decision. But I think that from an engineering standpoint, that's the fundamental question. How much of it's individual choice at what time you want to watch it and how much of it is you want to watch uh, uh, simultaneously with other people in the country. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else want to chime in on that? Okay, fine. I just have one other uh, question. Mr. Smith, the, in, in the Pittsburgh area, roughly about 8 percent of the, the people in my region uh, get their broadcast with, with rabbit ears, you know, over the air right. broadcasting. And I, I was just curious if, if you have any numbers on how many people, uh, 8%, yeah, 8%, yeah, 8, uh, watch with rabbit ears. Uh, how, many, how many people, do you, do you have any numbers on how many people watch HDTV uh, over the air with, you know, the rabbit ears versus relying on standard uh, Def, is there any kind of figures like that you can well, give us? Well, I've, I've heard the range from 8 percent to 20 percent, um, but I think it's a couple other factors that are important depending on your congressional district. For example, Mr. Barton's district, it may go as high as 40 percent. And over the air it tends to be about people who are rural, who are poor, who are elderly, um, who uh, have also invested in the digital transition. Do you think they have HDTVs? Uh, I believe the, the figure of $25 billion, which is an estimate um, uh, of what people have spent in the digital transition, I think many of them do now, and they really like high definition, and they don't want to see it degraded, and they're beginning to really value the multicasting, 
so that they get a religious channel, a weather channel, a, a Hispanic channel, a Korean channel. This is, this is the miracle that is now uh, made possible because we all did this. Um, and it's a very exciting future that I hate to see clouded uh, by uh, ill-considered ideas that pit broadband against broadcast. I, I do think in the, old, in the fullness of time there will be technologies that will provide for both. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, I have no more questions. I'll yield back. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Doyle. The gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Ensby, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Largent, um, we know Americans are going to be looking at their cell phone much more frequently and are on an hourly basis. Just wonder what uh, suggestion you could give us on things that we could do here or FCC to promote investment in the networks that are really going to be necessary. Could you just give your general thoughts about that? Well, uh, number one, I would applaud what the FCC did uh, in November uh, by approving the, the tower siting initiative. Uh, we have been fighting this battle for a long time of uh, giving uh, local jurisdictions, states, the ability to object to tower siting pr proposals, uh, but doing it in a timely fashion. Uh, and that, that goes a long way to helping this industry provide more service to this country. Uh, so I really applaud the FCC for their action uh, on the tower siting. Uh, the two bills that we're looking at today are kind of the beginning of the process, the end of the process. Uh, the spectrum inventory bill looks at uh, the, the, the possible spectrum that's out there, how it's being used, and what spectrum could be identified for uh, higher and better use, perhaps. Uh, and then your bill uh, comes in at the end of the process and says, uh, here's a more orderly fashion to um, uh, move uh, the, the current spectrum holders to their new spectrum and do it in a more efficient, effective way uh, and do it faster. Uh, so both of these bills are, are good bills and uh, go a long way to improving the process of acquiring additional spectrum, which the wireless industry is sorely going to need in the years to come. I uh, want to make sure I didn't miss anyone's. I didn't hear any good uh, or even not so good constructive criticism of our bill, and I wanted to make sure I hadn't missed any. Does anyone have any suggestions on the bill that I'm working with Mr. Upton on that you would suggest to improve the product? We're always looking for good suggestions. This might be the first hearing in American history where there isn't any constructive criticism, so this is quite an achievement. Mr. Calabrese, you've uh, suggested broadening the purpose of the Spectrum Relocation Fund to support modernizing federal systems and allowing for a greater degree of band sharing. Could you give us any sense what you would be suggestive of as far as cost and what type of approach? Right. It's very difficult to know the exact cost. In fact, I would assume probably, you know, first of all, that this, that the agencies that would be proposing to modernize their system to, to free up uh, uh, spectrum for sharing, that they would be, in a sense, second in line. You know, there would be first, uh, from that spectrum relocation fund, a priority for those agencies that uh, needed to uh, migrate off a band so that it could be cleared uh, for licensing, as we did with AWS, you know, the fundamental purpose of your bill. But then secondarily, you know, there's, you know, like now we have, we have uh, remaining funds. And, and then I think they should, uh, agencies should be able to apply uh, to the technical uh, panel that, that you propose in the bill setting up, um, which would then recommend to OMB which of those, you know, on a competitive uh, basis, which of those would, would have the, the greatest impact in terms of freeing up spectrum for the commercial sector or for spectrum efficiency. And, and it's really a great benefit because it would make those agencies more effective with more modern communication while also uh, freeing up spectrum. Thank you very much, Mr. Inslee. Um, I'm going to ask unanimous consent on behalf of the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, to insert in the record a letter concerning the subject matter before us of the Electronic Warfare and Information Operations Association. Without objection, uh, that will be made a part of the record. And the gentlelady from California, Ms. Bonomack, is recognized for five minutes. I thank the chair. I'd like to ask a question of Dr. Johnson. 
Uh, in your testimony, you indicated that future government spectrum needs will be focused on high bandwidth uses such as video for UAVs uh, or high altitude surveillance aircraft. Is that correct? That is, yes, that is correct. Can you please provide an estimate of the percentage of the DOD's high bandwidth video capacity used by UAVs and other surveillance aircraft uh, that is currently provided by commercial satellite systems using spectrum above 10 gigahertz? Uh, no, I can't provide that, but we uh, can provide that after the hearing. I right, thank you. And uh, do you believe that most of the future high bandwidth video capacity for the UAVs also uh, will use spectrum above 10 gigahertz? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, I thank you. If I can get the answers uh, in writing after the hearing, that would be great. And at this point, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to my colleague, uh, <laughs> Steve Buyer, if he's available. Thank you. Thank you very much. The question I have, and I thank you for, for yielding, is uh, it's about the delays in the delivery of spectrum and its impact on delivering commercial systems. So when you look back, uh, even back in 2006 when uh, T-Mobile paid a, a lot of money out there, $4.2 billion for Spectrum, you know, we're four or five years down range now and we still don't have systems being delivered. And uh, so when, you, when we lay out these timelines for the delivery and they're not met. So um, I look at this legislation as before us and I, I'm interested in your opinions if I were to offer an amendment, and so Mr. Markey talks about giving encouragement, what about if we were, I would offer an amendment that has a penalty clause so that if a government department or agency does not deliver the relocation uh, at the timeline that's specified, whether it's classified or unclassified, then that department uh, or agency is to pay interest on the monies relative to where that spectrum is located. So you can figure out what the economic impact would be. So if DOD says, well, we just, it's too difficult for us to deliver the spectrum from Mobile, Pensacola to Jacksonville because we have our classified issues. Well, deal with it then. Tell us what they are. You said you could deliver on a particular date, then deal with it. And uh, so I'm interested if I were to offer such an amendment as an incentive, because if we ask for these companies to put billions of dollars, you're asking for a next auction, we do the next auction, government takes the money, and we use the money, yet aren't delivering when we said we would. And so in the end, you know, uh, Mr. Smith, you, you talked about public values. Public values are based upon virtues. If you're going to have a deal, you can't have a deal without fidelity, and fidelity requires two people, two people. And so if government is not upholding its fidelity, then maybe we should have an encouragement clause called a penalty clause. What are your ideas, your thoughts? Mr. Largent? Well, I, I, I like your thinking going into this, but I would, I would prefer, I mean, and I'm just thinking about this freewheeling right now, uh, so I wasn't prepared for the question, but as I think about it, I think perhaps you could build incentives for uh, the people that are moving off the spectrum to get off so that you give them the spectrum relocation money, you would give them, you know, uh, some amount of money uh, if they're off in a year and you give them something less than that amount if they're off in two years. So you give them more money to relocate the faster they're able to relocate as opposed to the same amount of money whenever they relocate. Well, we can incentivize and penalize, right? We, we like incentives. I understand. Mr. Smith? Congressman, uh, NAB really doesn't have a dog in the fight, so to say. Um, but having said that, I. I applaud the way you're thinking because I think it would have the effect of incentivizing uh, more interest in spectrum auctions if they knew that there was a two-way street and they would be treated fairly. Well, thank you. Well, I would like to explore this idea with not only my colleagues but, but with you on how we can build this into this, this next piece of legislation. Thank you. I yield back. Well, I'd have to uh, put a second degree amendment on your amendment. And we'd have to punish all members of Congress who spend that spectrum money five times over. <laughs> Ooh, I agree with you. But. And with that, I think we'll close this happy hearing. Thank you to all of our witnesses. Uh, have a good holiday, and thank you for being here. Wow. 
President Obama today outlined some of the missteps that led to an attempted airline bombing on Christmas Day. The president spoke briefly from a Marine